Without further ado, I'll talk, call, turn it over to Ms. Glenn uh, to call the roll. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Hello. I'm going to start with uh, uh, Chairman Randall Tuttle. I am present. Uh, Vice Chairman Commissioner Curtis. I'm uh, present here. Commissioner Hal Day. Present. Commissioner Tom Griffin. Present. Commissioner Yvonne Hines. Present. Com Commissioner Hugh Jernigan. I don't see him. Commissioner Jernigan. Okay. Commissioner Dwayne. Dwayne Long. Present. Commissioner Chris Parker. Present. Commissioner Donald Stewart. Present. Commissioner Charles Wilson. Present. Commissioner Allen Younger. Commissioner Allen Younger. Commissioner Hugh Jernigan. Here. Okay. And then Commissioner Allen Younger. All right. Thank you. Thanks, Patrice. Uh, welcome uh, to Jeff Coggins of Black and Beach. Look forward to hearing from you, Jeff. And of course, and you see somewhere over there, there's Bill. Bill Brewer, uh, our water guru, is also with us along with additional staff. I think, actually, Courtney, I'm still in some of your thunder. You're going to tell us all this thing. So <laughs> I'll turn it over to you. Okay, yes, I, I will announce from uh, staff and any uh, visitors that we have. So. Damon Decane, Assistant City Manager, Patrice Glenn, Senior Administrative Assistant, Mike Quivisto, Deputy Director, Jan McCarg, Assistant Director of Solid Waste, Michael Stover, Assistant Director of Operations, Bill Brewer, Water Treatment Superintendent, Shane Chu Huffman, Capital Projects Engineer, Todd Lewis, Senior Civil Engineer, Marcus Felton, Field Operations Engineer, Gail Kettler and Kyra Boyd, Communications Team, Lisa Saunders, Chief Financial Officer, and I believe um, I saw Kelly Latham join the call as well. She's the Deputy um, Finance Officer, and she's, she's new to the city of Winston-Salem. She's on the call as well. Um, Jerry Bates, Purchasing Director, Marilena jensen Goosehold, Assistant City Attorney, Kirk Bjorling, Real Estate Administrator, uh, Jakira Westbrook, Office of Business Inclusion and Advancement, Heather Curry, Budget Office and Jeff Coggins with Black and Beach. So we've got a full group of, um, of people on the call today. Um, just a couple of announcements that I'll, I'll go over real quickly. Um, we send out news releases um, probably a few every week, and the majority of our news releases are for street closures or you know water shutoffs that are for water and sewer related work within the street. Um, occasionally, we have other news release, uh, releases that go out if we were to, say, change the operating hours at the landfill during the holidays, or if we wanted to send out any kind of information for our AMI project, or we have sent out news releases for, um, you know, assistance that's available for our customers that are, are struggling to pay their water sewer bill. So there's a variety of reasons that we would send out a news release. and. If anybody wants from the commission wants to be on that list to get those emails, if you'll contact uh, Gail Kettler or you can send it to me, um, we'll add you to that list. I know one of the commission members is already on that list. So if you're interested in getting anything utility related as far as news releases, just, just let us know. Um, so I wanted to put that out there. Um, the renovations to our new space is on schedule. I want you uh, to know each other. And even though you said it once, it needs to be said more than once. Okay, sorry. So um, it's, the construction is scheduled to be complete by the end of April. So hopefully administrative staff is, will be ready to move in um, at the beginning of May. So that's, we're, we're hopeful that that will happen. Uh, just a reminder that our capital and operating budget meetings are coming up. The first one is March 23rd at 1.30. That meeting will be to present the capital plan. And then April 20th at 1.30, we'll present, we will present the operating budget and rate recommendations. And then April 27th we, at 1.30, we have a follow-up meeting if needed to discuss any 
outstanding issues regarding the budget. Um, in the past, we haven't needed we hadn't needed that meeting, but um, it is on the schedule just in case. Will all these be Zoom meetings? Yes. Uh, so that was that's um, exactly what I was getting ready to say. Yes, that all of our meetings from here on out are are, are going to remain virtual. I know I've had some conversations with some of the commission members about when we're going to be back in person. And at this point, I just don't have a good um, answer to that. I can't tell you when we'll be back in person, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. Um, so all these will be virtual. Any questions about any of that before, before I keep going? Okay. Um, so Jeff Coggins of Black and Beach is with us, and he's going to give the commission an update on the Nielsen project. Um, I wanted to remind the, the commission about the scope of work and for this project and the critical need for it. Um, Nielsen is our oldest plant. It is our largest plant and it is the workhorse of our system. So uh, last April, we received bids on Nielsen and uh, they were significantly over budget. And at this point, at that point, we, we waited, we wanted to wait a little bit to gain more clarity on how the pandemic would impact our, our utility and our revenues. So we're at a point now where we, um, where we need to move forward. So um, Jeff's gonna go over the, the project and go into a little bit more detail about um, you know, the bids and where the market's at now. So, and then after Jeff's presentation, we'll discuss the agenda items, and then a financial update. If there are time, if there's time, we'll go over our normal water, sewer, and solid waste update. And at the end of our meeting today, we'll go into closed session to discuss the Muddy Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant uh, project with our attorneys. And at that point, we'll do a breakout session um, to go into that closed session. So um, any, any questions? Okay, with that, I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Jeff. So, <clears throat> I am attempting to share my screen. Let me know when you can see it. We can see okay. it. Okay. And thank you, Courtney. Uh, and, and thank you all for the opportunity to, to speak with you today. Uh, I am planning to talk about, uh, um, you know, the, the needs and conditions of Nielsen and and the purpose of the modernization study. And as Courtney said, uh, we can, uh, towards the end of the discussion, it's more details about uh, the uh, April 2020 um, bid and where we see the market today. <clears throat> the presentation is, is, is divided into four segments. The first is just a little bit of a history of Nielsen and its role in your system uh, from a capacity, placement, everything perspective. Uh, and then the two primary reasons for the modernization, one is for water quality, uh, to improve water quality of, uh, to your customers. And second is this the re re reliability of the plant itself uh, to be able to, to meet, meet needs. And again, towards the end, uh, cost and schedule. Um, this is your meeting. Please interrupt with questions. Um, I am at a little bit disadvantaged not being able to see who may have a question. So um, yell, yell or, or whatever is appropriate, whatever you're normally doing in these uh, closed sessions to, to get my attention. Uh, Courtney, if you will help in that regard, I'd appreciate it. So a little quick history. Uh, this is an aerial view of the Nielsen property. Um, the original plant was a 24 MGD facility. Uh, two process trains, each 12 MGD each, um, located over, um, my, my cursor's not working, over on the lower right side, you can see the, 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 where the plan is. Uh, at that time, that was in the early 60s. At that time, it was a 24 MGD facility, uh, and, the, and the two raw water reservoirs were, were part of that. Uh, then in the early 80s, there was a, a 12 MGD module added. Uh, then later in the late 80s, another uh, 12 MGD model, module was added. So uh, the current facilities at, at Nielsen are for 48 MGD capacity. That, that's uh, MGD is million gallons per day. So that's what the plant can treat and that's what is permitted to do um, as of today. 
this gives you a glimpse of other projects that happened. Again, you see it highlighted in color as the original 61 and the 80, uh, 82 and 88 projects. There's been a number of uh, other small uh, upgrades to the plant. Probably the most significant was in 07 when the chemical building was modernized. Uh, but really nothing was done to those original three, um, uh, the 61, 82 and 88 uh, projects since then. So um, your infrastructure is aging um, and uh, has been in need for some modernization for, for, for a number of years now. Um, you do have three plants. Uh, the Nielsen shown uh, towards the lo lower part of your screen. Um, it's, it is your largest of, of the plants at 48 MGD, as, as Courtney uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, the Thomas plant to the, to the upper right or center right, uh, that's the plant that was modernized um, uh, within the last decade. Um, it, it's it, it's, it's uh, uh, an 18 MGD facility. And the Swan plant uh, uh, upper left is, is uh, a 25 MG facility. Uh, the Swan plant is located near the Yadkin. The Yadkin actually follows the uh, uh, left side of the county line here. Uh, the, the Swan plant has its own intake facility on the Yadkin River. The Nielsen plant uh, has a, it gets its water from the Idols facility. So all the water from Idols is also on the Yadkin flow to the Nielsen plant. And then from Nielsen, uh, in those raw water reservoirs, flow goes into the Nielsen plant proper and also flows by gravity down to the Thomas plant. Uh, and your Thomas plant receives flow from the Yadkin via Nielsen, uh, but it also gets uh, water from Salem Lake. This graphic shows the uh, demands uh, of your system viewed through the lens of, of the different plants over time. So the blue bars represents uh, historical uh, demands of, of, of the plant. And then also to the right of that uh, under the 2035 heading is the um, uh, future demands. Uh, and we'll see that how it's distributed uh, in the future, but uh, the planning that was done in the past. Uh, so Hazen and Sawyer did a 2015 uh, water system master plan. Um, and, and most of these numbers come from that plan. Um, uh, HDR is in the process of updating that master plan. And one of the early outcomes of that uh, study of that work uh, was their water facilities capacity assessment. Um, and uh, the HDR, HDR study has re reconfirmed that the previous numbers, the previous demands of the system are, are still in play. Uh, to the left in, in the blue ba uh, bar is, is some of the historical and projected future uh, demands of, of your system. You did see a, your, your uh, maximum uh, max day demand of record uh, occurred in 2002. Uh, that occurred during a, the drought of 2002. Um, you saw... Uh, there's been two significant droughts that's occurred uh, in the last couple of decades, one in 2002, the other in 2007. Uh, in one of those cases, 2007, the demands of your system went up about 10 MGD. Um, and in 2002, it went up, uh, I think it was around 14 MGD. So you saw a, a, a spike in, uh, in 2002. Um, you can see the other demands. Uh, at the bottom gives you the capacity of your system at 91 MGD. So, uh, 48 MGD from Nielsen, 18 from Thomas, and 25 from Swan. You add those up, you have the, uh, the ability to uh, treat 91 MGD. So you're at a very healthy capacity perspective, um, um, which we'll be talking about here in a minute. One thing I do want to note as it pertains to Nielsen itself is the... Um, Regulations have changed since the 60s and early 80s when, when those facilities were built. Uh, and if you were to apply today's um, standards um, to, to the Nielsen facility and rated the plant around those today's standards, uh, the Nielsen plant would uh, have a rating somewhere around 21 MGD. We'll talk about that in a little bit, but part of the need for the modernization is to um, allow the plant to treat in today's standards at a much higher capacity and get, get up towards the 48 MGD. 
This is the same uh, map, your distribution uh, map, but it uh, highlights <clears throat> by plant and area, uh, the area served, the service area served by each of the plants. Um, and this is how it's ran on a, on a normal day when everything's uh, functioning properly and everything's uh, at capacity and there's not any challenges going on in the system. Uh, a particular note uh, I want to bring to your attention is, is the importance of Nielsen. Courtney talked about it being your workhorse plant. It is your largest plant. Um, it was um, uh, the plant that covered the entire Swan zone before Swan was there. So the piping infrastructure uh, extending from Nielsen to Sides and Chitty and on from there out to the distribution system is already in place to be able to serve the entire Swan uh, service area. And Nielsen actually um, uh, supplied all the water to the Thomas service area when the Thomas plant was down for reconstruction. Uh, the infrastructure is already there. Um, there is infrastructure to allow Swan to take a larger role into the Nielsen zone if it need to be, or Thomas to go into the Nielsen or Swan zone if need to be, but there's not enough infrastructure in place from either one of those two plants to cover the county uh, like you can with Nielsen. So uh, Nielsen is your workhorse. When you, when they hear workhorse, it, it really is the, the, the backbone of your system. So um, anyway. Uh, from a demand perspective, uh, going forward, uh, this is straight out of the 2020 uh, water facilities capacity uh, assessment. Uh, it's projected uh, demands of your system. Uh, so if you look at the top of the dark blue, that's the overall system demand. It's starting to over 60 MGD expected in 2025 and uh, a little over 70 at uh, 2045. Um, and each of the colors represents, again, based on the planner, where uh, is the best place to, the, the best, where to get the capacity to best serve your, uh, your customers. So depending on where the demand is and, and where the plant's located, it, it, gives, it gives you a kind of distribution of, of, of the demand of each of the plants. There has been some discussion about what is the uh, best capacity forward for, for Nielsen. Should it remain at 48 MGD, or should we consider something uh, less than that? And, and when you start talking about less than that, you're, you're really your choices are to, to, to go to a 36 or 24 just by eliminating um, a, a train or two or by derating a train or two. Um, and this kind of shows you the, the top bar is your 91 MGD. That's your, that's your full uh, uh, current treatment uh, system capacity at 91 MGD when Nielsen's at 48. And as you step down, they're stepping down at 12 MGD increments. Um, as I mentioned earlier, um, during the, the drought of 2002, 2007, uh, you benefited from having ca capacity to be able to cover um, that drought buffer. This bar that's shown above is, is at 10 MGD. And again, yours were, your two peaks resulted in a 10 MGD increase uh, in 2007 and a 14 M MGD increase in 2002. So, um, yeah. I want right. to pause here. Yes, yes, Mr. Griffin. Uh, the projections that we're showing for the three plants, they came from HDR's 2020 report, is that correct? That's correct. So, so okay. uh, Courtney brought your request to my attention, uh, talked to Bill about it and others, and we had a, a meeting. And as you were requesting an upgrade, HDR had just finished it about two or three months earlier, and that's this 2020 okay. uh, capacity assessment. And it was specific to your request of identifying the capacity needs of the plants to meet the capacity of the system. Okay. And, um, you know, I've reviewed it. It, it, it was a well, not, well done, well done report. So. Okay. Um, at this point, well, any other questions about capacity, capacity needs of, of Nielsen? If I, if I may, not on Nielsen, but on Thomas, you show it as a capacity of 18 MGD, but a maximum of 10 something. That, 
that one was recently renovated. The, the three, the most recently renovated, correct? No, no. So, so this graphic is the maximum daily demands of your system. Okay. And then, so if you look at the far left column, the 2025 column, your, your system demands as projected by HDR is going to be 60, 61 MGD, the top of the, of the blue, dark blue. Of that, um, they've assessed that to, the best way for you to economically reliably serve that 61 MGD, 32 of that should come from Nielsen, 10 and change from Thomas, and 18 and change from Swan. You can, you can treat more than, than 10 at Thomas. You can treat 18. Uh, they're just saying on that max day of 2025, um, they only need 10.4 uh, MGD. So, so we could turn on Thomas and run all 18? You can, but you need to have demand in the area that Thomas is serving, or you have to s expand the service area that which Thomas is serving. Okay. Um, or you'd have to open up some hydrants or whatever. But yes, you, you could pump it in. Uh, you can pump 18 MGD from Thomas and, and dist it's distribute it throughout the service area, but the most beneficial and economic way based on your planners is you only need in 2025, 10 MGD from Thomas on this max day demand. Let, let me also say, I, I should have said earlier, these projections are based on normal operating conditions. All your facilities available, all your pipe servicing are, are, are operable. You don't have any breakdowns or, or pumps out of service, that kind of thing. So this is intending to say, what does your customers need? Um, and what does your, how, how's the best way to serve it with a fully functioning and operating system? So in, 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 in the request to, can you run Thomas at 18? Yes. Um, having, you know, six to 10 MGD of surplus at the plant allows a lot of operational flexibility at the plant to treat a higher quality water and not be at peak, peak demand, but it also allows you to send excess water if you ramped it up to 18 into other parts. So if, if Nielsen we're going to go through a modernization like we're talking about. Uh, the plan is to take a 48 MG pl uh, plant and during the construction period, run it at no more than 24 MGD. So we're going to take half the plant offline. Well, that's in, in the 2025 scenario here, uh, we're going to be about seven MGD less than what the plant of that service area, we're going to be able to tr treat less than, than what the, the service area needs. So that excess capacity during that period of time will come from Thomas and Swan. They may ramp Thomas up to 17 MGD and, and Swan up a couple MGD to balance it out. That's something that Bill and his staff will be trying to figure out is what's the best way to, to deal with a distribution network that's uh, only has Nielsen for a three or four year period at 24 MGD. This is Harold Day. I got a question. All our plants together, are we producing about 50% of the capacity on a daily use of all three of them combined? So our average day demands, you, yeah, that is a fairly correct statement. I don't know if it's exactly 50, but I mean, it's, you somewhere know, in the 50 to 60% range, right. yes, yes. Okay, that's just what I wanted to try. I was trying to calculate this here. We're about 50% of our capacity right now on a daily use on average. On average, yes. Okay. Uh, and, and that's one of the challenges for water treatment in that you, most utilities need to hit their max day demand, those three weeks in the summertime um, or, or depending on what season, you know, what, what the utility is. But yes, it's usually a summertime maximum um, and you have to build infrastructure in the ground to pump it uh, out and you've got to have the treatment capacity to do it. The other side of the equation is it's, it's, uh, it's harder to treat water in, when it's cold. So uh, lots of times people say, well, you got a, a 91 MGD capacity. Yes, but in the heart of the winter, it's really nice to get down in the 50 to 60 to better treat a, a harder quality or a water that's harder to treat um, where, where there's less demand. So, um, 
But yes, somewhere in the 50 to 60% range. I don't have the number exact. Uh, Bill may have it. It's, it's about 30, 36 MGD. So it's, it's on average, it's about 40% of our treatment capacity. But as Jeff mentioned, you have to take into consideration those peak days in the summertime because that's, that's really where you use that capacity. Great questions. Other questions about capacity of the system, capacity of Nielsen? Bill? Uh, yes, sir. Question. Um, a while ago, Jeff had the thing about the 21 MGD, if we were operating under the current state regs, how much water are we producing at Nielsen today? <laughs> Are we producing more than 21? And if we are, is it not of a quality that we won't speak about or what? Help me with that. Well, it, it, it is today. Today, it's probably around around 20 to 21. The, the challenge that Nielsen has is those basins are, are so short and the way that they're designed is water, water basically comes into them and it hits a wall and it's forced up. And that doesn't allow the flock that we produce to settle out. That'll, yeah, and it, it pushes it right on top of those filters. It's a hydraulic issue. And, it, you know, at the time the plant was designed, you know, they were treating to a 5 NTU turbidity standard. And, and now we're, we're treating to a 0.1 NTU turbidity standard. Right. Does, does that answer your question? Well, I, I guess I, I was just concerned that if we're producing good quality water is basically what I'm asking. The, the answer is yes. We, we treat to a 0.1 standard, and if we can't reach that on a, even on a particular filter, we'll, we'll take it out of service. Okay. What happens in the winter is your water, as it gets colder, it gets denser. And, it, and, and that exacerbates the settling problem because the flock won't settle. And what that does is it drastically shortens your filter runs. And we, we've been in situations at Nielsen where we have to wash a filter every 12 hours and we normally get a, a minimum of 72 hour runs. And, and that can be very problematic. Yeah. Uh, Jeff, I've got a question. This is Don Stewart. Okay. Um, you had mentioned earlier uh, the functionality uh, operation of our system uh, and it being 100% operational. Is our total system 100% operational or is uh, there some drawbacks there? I don't know if I'm, I'm clear or not. Drawbacks. But. So, so my statement was re regarding the planners, the planning people who come up with these projections. They're not building in extra capacity at different facilities or uh, anywhere in the system um, to cover for a line break or a drought or um, a contaminant that may take for whatever reason, um, Salem, Salem Lake out of, out of, out of the equation. Um, that, that gets more into sort of like a, a re resiliency discussion uh, where you look at where, where, are, where could you have catastrophic or uh, capacity limiting uh, occurrences that could come in your system and how would your system react? And do you have the ability to, to um, um, move water where your customers need them in, in times of those challenges. Uh, we're looking at this graph through the lens of treatment only. What does your customers need from a demand? And then when you start looking at resiliency, um, that's when you put in the, the, uh, the drought buffer. What, what's your ability to, to treat during a drought? What's your ability to treat if, if Thomas were to come offline for some reason, like it did when it was under construction? or if, if you lost a train at Swan, or if you lost the pumps at Swan. I know there was a power uh, challenge, um, was, it, was it last year, Bill, or two years ago, that uh, the generators didn't come on, um, and uh, Bill in 
and company have the ability to open and close and move water around and serve that area from Nielsen uh, while they took care of that issue. And I don't believe any of your customers, and y'all may not have ever known that that even occurred, but that's, that's the benefit of having the excess capacity and having the piping networks in place and having a staff that's uh, committed to making sure that uh, no matter what happens, that your customers are served. So. Yeah, another, if I could speak to that point, you know, resiliency has become a, a very big deal for us. You know, everyone, you guys have all heard of the American Water Infrastructure Act and as part of the master plan that HDR did, one of the key points that came out of that was the layout of our system and the resiliency that we have. Another example of what Jeff is talking about, in 2013, we, we had a, a, a horizontal split on the main leaving Swan, and we had to shut Swan down to repair that main. And it happened late in the summer um, where we still had very high demands. Um, and Nielsen was able to, to cover that. We, we took Swan out of, out of service and made that repair and none of our customers were impacted and had Nielsen not, not been available at least to its current capacity, um, that would have, that would have been problematic for the, for the 1090 zone in and of itself. Um, and you know, Nielsen, Jeff mentioned this, but Nielsen can serve all five pressure zones. Swan can only serve three of the five, and Thomas can only serve two of the five. So that, that resiliency from an operational perspective to us is, is invaluable. What, what kind of impact will uh, the modernization have on our system um, as it's being, um, as the, uh, it's been modernized? So the plan would be to take half the plant out of service to do the modernization. So two of the four 12 MGD trains would come out of service and you would do upgrades on those. So the plant would then be operating uh, at or around a 24 MGD max for the period of the construction. You'd bring up the new facilities uh, that's just been repaired and modernization, bring those on, get comfortable running them, and then you'd go and do the same thing to the other half. So for just about the entire construction duration, which is currently 42 months, um, Nielsen would be at a, a 24 NGD capacity. Uh, Jeff Bell, this is Chris Parker. Um, I understand the importance of the resiliency that you're discussing. But tell me about this drought buffer. Is that, does that include resiliency or is that just based on irrigation needs? I mean, where do you come up with that, that estimate for the drought buffer? So I'm showing in the graphic a 10 MGD buffer line there. Uh, in 2002, during the drought 2002, your demands jumped up. Um, it was around 14 MGD above uh, the max day demands on, on the previous year in front and year after. So I, I took that as the, the impact of the drought was 14 MGD. Uh, 2007, I did the same thing. We looked at the years preceding and postseding 2007, and 2007 was about 10 MGD higher than the, than the other two years. Uh, so I took it as 10 MGD. I've, I've, on the conservative low side, put a 10 MGD buffer here, saying that the impact of a drought to your system historically has been around 10 MGD. So you have choices. Oh, you have choices. If you didn't have that excess capacity, that extra 10 MGD capacity, um, and, and you were operating near, near max demands, um, you're, you're, you, if you didn't have that capacity, you, you would be putting out uh, notices to the public uh, to, to initially do voluntary conservation. Uh, ultimately, if you really had to, you go to uh, mandatory conservation and really start restricting um, your, your, 
your supply is being restricted and you're wanting your, your, your customers to respect that and, and to use less water. Yeah, in, a, in addition to that, if, if we happen to, to bump up against that 80 and 90% um, consumption versus production <laughs> capacity, we, we would then, if, if we got into that realm, we would need to start looking for additional capacity. It, it just, it depends on the situation, but the, our, our resiliency is our ability to, to deal and mitigate um, not only um, operational maintenance or emergencies, but also um, environmental impacts such as drought. Bill, if, if I could just kind of follow up on that, I, I understand there's two, two parts of this. One is, you know, how much water we're actually able to get. And during the drought, the water supply may decrease, but I don't think we've got a water supply issue coming into the system. What this drought is about is in these in this analysis is based on we got the water in the system, but we're you know how we can process that water, and and so if it's a processing of the water, we still have water coming into the system that's available from the Yakin or whatever other sources. So, is it mainly irrigation? I mean, what what would create an increased demand from the the water we're producing above what's normal? Well, anytime you have dry condition, your your demand goes up. Um, customers use more. A, a lot of it is ir irrigation. Um, you know, you, it's usually associated with hotter temperatures. So there's a lot more, you know, out, outdoor activities involving water going on. So it, you know, it, our demand basically weather has a big impact on it, and. and so it's all those things kind of grouped together. Hopefully that, that answers, answers your question. But a lot, a lot of it is irrigation. I mean, people do irrigate a lot during droughts because they want their, you know, their yards to look nice, but. Um, it's car washes, swimming pools, kids playing in the sprinklers. Um, yeah. it's, it's recreation and irrigation. Should I move ahead? Any more questions on, on uh, this? One more, Jeff. Okay. Um, in the old days, uh, 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 was it Jeff Crookshank? Is that who it was? Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> He's still around. <laughs> Is he? Okay, yeah. surprise. <laughs> How did H do, do you know the technology that HDR used to do what they did versus what all the old projections that we used to get? I mean, is it new whiz bang stuff or uh, what is it? Well, H Hazen and Sawyer in 2015, they, they updated the model um, and they used. Um, you know, the, the traffic area zone maps that predict where the population <laughs> growths are going to be. Um, and they also use consumption data, billing data from the time, um, you know, from that year. Um, and HDR basically went back and updated those numbers um, for, for the current year, since it was about, it was five, it's about five years later, um, and put a second set of eyes on that data and basically validated the numbers. Okay. All right, thanks. Harold Day, I got a question. Do we know of any big industrial plant coming to town in the next few years? It's gonna be a big consumer of water. Has anybody heard anything about that? Uh, this, this is Damon. I'll, I'll try and give that an answer. Right. Um, good afternoon, commissioners, staff, everybody. Um, so the short answer, Mr. Day, is, is no. And I think um, Mr. Griffin and I have had this conversation, uh, well, probably for the last five or so years that, you know, another advantage of having this capacity above and beyond the whole discussion that we just had is 
it is a marketable attribute of Forsyth County. You know, I, I, it's near and dear to me. I came from the Sonoran Desert, and, um, you know, if we could spare a drop of water, somebody was there to buy it and put something up and create jobs. Here, it's a little different, but but for Scythe County, with, with the agreement you have at Kerr Scott and the ability to treat and supply water um, is something that I think as, as a county, you know, that we need to be looking at in marketing for just what you asked about. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, I'll, I'll continue and I'm gonna speed up a little bit because I, I think Courtney we may be consuming a little bit more time than you were wanting. Uh, I did have a quick summary slide here of, of the benefits of Nielsen uh, at a 48 MG capacity. Uh, first and, and probably the biggest is you do have the linear infrastructure in place already to serve the entire county from Nielsen. It gives you the most resiliency um, you can lose some or all of Swan or some or all of Thomas for a period of time and, and Nielsen can cover that area with the pipes in the ground, no additional uh, cost to the, to the uh, uh, commission to, to implement and, and it just seamlessly does what it needs to do. Um, uh, Nielsen in itself at 48 MGD is the workhorse. It is producing a lot of water. Uh, but after the modernization is up at 48 MGD, it will be able to take a, a train offline and do upgrades and repairs to a train while still maintaining 36 MGD across the, across the uh, way and, and meet the system demands. Um, and as we spent some time on, um, it does system-wise, having Nielsen at 48 MGD with your other plants, it, it does give you uh, capacity needs to, to handle uh, severe weather, uh, drought conditions, um, without having to do some type of uh, system-wide conservation. So this is the basic scope of, of, of the modernization. There's a lot of things going on. I am not touching hardly any of these, but I just wanted to see there is a big laundry list of stuff that's incorporated. Uh, it's been since the 60s and 80s since the plant's been updated and just about everywhere you turn there's something that needs to be uh, replaced or uh, advanced or or it's, it's just obsolete so um, I do want to spend a little bit of time and I'm gonna fly through here pretty quick again I'm talking about things that are, are set aside for the purposes of improving water quality um, and I've got pictures in different spots. So I'm just going to wing it from what I've got here. But uh, um, as the water comes into your plant, it goes through a couple stages of, of mixing. First is rapid mix followed by flocculation. And what you're trying to do here is with a lot of energy, mix the chemicals for your raw water uh, uh, coming in the plant, mix the chemicals really quick and then send them into the flocculation zones so it could slowly, gradually go through a series of tapered speed mixers where, the, where you're trying to build a really nice, robust flock that's going to settle in the next stage. So that's all you're really trying to do at the beginning of the plant is put, get the right chemistry in place and start creating flock that's going to settle out in your sed basins. And particularly on the Nielsen side of Nielsen or Nielsen 1, 2, or the, I guess what we call the uh, 61 uh, plant, um, you've got poorly sized facilities. The, the mixers are way past their useful life. They're not able to change the speed on them. They're fixed. And, and uh, anyway... Um, a large portion of, the, of this project is to improve uh, the geometry of your, your rapid mix and flocculation uh, basins and to put in uh, new mixers and mixers that could optimize the pretreatment of the water so it settles out in the said basins. Um, Bill touched on the your, your biggest challenge that Nielsen has is the said basins are too small. Uh, the, this, the said basins alone is what was limiting the uh, rated capacity if you look to today's standards to 21 MGD. Uh, another attribute is that solid settle and they sit on the bottom of the, of the, uh, uh, of the uh, uh, said basins. Uh, and as it sits there, some of the contaminants was captured in the flock that were settled out 
has an opportunity to resuspend into the process and 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 re-engage in the water where we want it to be once it's removed we want to get it evacuated out so part of the project is to reconfigure the basin so we have better flow split uh, put in plate settlers, which is a theoretical way of making the basins bigger without having to tear down walls and build, uh, put a lot of concrete in and a lot of walls. So it's a, a higher technology of taking small basins and making them operate effectively like they're large basins as plate settlers. Um, and then we're going to put sludge collection on the floor. So when the solids hit the floor, their contaminants are in the solids that have been removed from the water like we wanted to do, we want to evacuate it from that process and, and get it to our waste stream so it can't re-enter re into the primary flow stream of the plant. The filters have challenges. Okay, Jeff, Jeff yes, this is yes. Randall. Just a really quick yes. question if you go back. And this is to the uh, Tom and Bill conversation on the 21 MGD. Mm -hmm. so since, since we are meeting the, the current standards of it was point O's and some ones. I mean, I can't remember the exact, help me, Bill. But anyway, since we're meeting the current standards, does that mean our effective capacity is only 21 MGD? I just wanna make sure I'm understanding that. It's not 48. You have a rated capacity of 48, a hydraulic capacity of 48, and Bill and his staff have been operating the plant higher than 21, anywhere in the 30s is where they've been doing most of it, low 30s to high 30s and doing a spectacular job uh, of, of running the plant and treating capacities high, but higher than 21 MGD and right. meeting so, so. all the current regulatory water quality requirements. The Got 21 so MGD is, is what it would be if it were uh, permitted today, I get that. So, but our effective capacity we're running on is in the, let's say low 30s. Effective capacity. Uh, we're, we're not a 48 MGD plan, is your point? Well, we we can process 48 MGD through Nielsen, and we've we've done it in the past. And meet the standards. And yes, meet sir. the standards. Yes. yes, sir. Okay. All right. All right. Thank you. That's more of a testimony to your staff than it is to the plant. That's 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 the that's the weak link here. Uh, a lot of the regulations are written around not having the quality staff that you have running your plants because you've got smaller utilities across the area that may have less knowledge of how to run the plant. So the state regulates the facilities as if you're all the same and therefore they have to make some a little bit more robust. So the standards are such that um, someone would, that anyway, bottom line is your, your staff is, is doing a tremendous job of, of keeping the plant going. I say tremendous for keeping it, keep, keeping it viable with the equipment they've got and doing so uh, to meeting current standards. So he's done a, doing a tremendous job. Yep. Thank you. Um, the filters, uh, you still got the uh, surface sweeps. Um, you know, today's filters have uh, air sky or backwash. You get a cleaner filter. Um, I, a lot of the challenges we're having or having with it is that is they don't have uh, rate control valves to better control the flow, balance the flow between the filters. Filter to waste is, is uh, um, which is when you bring a filter back on, it allows you to wash to waste instead of wash to the distribution system. Um, those are very limited. Uh, there's a number of things on the filters that just uh, are way outside today's standards that would be improved and replaced uh, as part of the modernization. Bill touched on this. Uh, the plant was built to a five NTU standard on filter water quality. Um, this is, should give you some uh, historical changes in regulation. This is not on how to treat, but what you're treating to, the limits by which you're gonna be treating to. Um, the, the original Nielsen 1-2 uh, plant, the original 24 inch module was designed around a five NTU filterability and Bill and his staff are now required to operate at less than 0.1 NTU. And they have been able to do that. But again, uh, in certain situations, they're having to wash the filters every 12 hours instead of every three days. And uh, really, really have to keep their eyes on it and 
when a valve locks up or, or um, an analyzer fails or whatever, uh, there's lots of questions that they have to run out and just really, really uh, investigate. Uh, but uh, this is the, the change in regulations on the uh, water quality side. The last thing I believe, this is the last slide on, on water quality is uh, you're currently recycling your backwash. Um, anything that's trapped on your, your filters, uh, particularly in my mind, cryptosporidium and giardia cyst uh, is, is one of the primary things that happens on the filters along with some other solids. When it gets trapped, you go through a filter backwash to clean that material off. That water right now is going down and being recirculating back to your plants, being pumped back up to your raw water reservoirs. And, and over time, if, if those contaminants are in the water, it can concentrate because it's constantly being treated, removed in, on the filters, backwashed, returned back up. So um, what you really wanna do, much like getting the solids off the floor of the uh, uh, sed basin, you want this waste stream to be treated and discharged and not returned, or at least treated and that contaminants removed from the waste stream before it is returned. So part of this project is to put in the facilities to uh, treat the uh, backwash supply so you don't have this situation. From a risk, risk, and, risk and reliability perspective, it's really the replacement of aging equipment. Um, first and foremost is your electrical systems there. Uh, most of the equipment has not been replaced since it was put in originally. Um, got some... Uh, um, equipment is put in the 60s and 80s. Um, it still has the fabric coated uh, wiring in the system. So uh, a lot of the parts needed to service this equipment to keep it in service is, is finding harder and harder to obtain. And Jeff, uh, uh, yes, just yes, sir. to speak to um, the point earlier, um, you know, we, we do have a very very talented group of people and, and support groups in instrumentation electrical. And in dealing with this older equipment, you know, they they get very creative in making it work sometimes. It just depends on the failure and what we're dealing with. But um, I cannot sing their laurels enough. They, they do a tremendous job in that respect. From a chemical hey, perspective, uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, Don Stewart again. Um, so most of this work will be for like all the systems and it, it won't be any structural or buildings or any type of additions like that, will it? So, so the primary goal was to reutilize as much of the facilities as possible. So we're, we're not changing the filter boxes. We're not changing the sed basins as far as the making them larger or tearing down walls and growing them. We are creating some channels, if you will, out of concrete within some of the existing structures with, within, but not with, you know, outside. It's not growing beyond its footprint. Uh, on the waste stream, uh, so when you backwash the filter, um, or if you have analyzer uh, flow goes through, instead of sending that somewhere, uh, all the clear water will go down to a new EQ base. And so there's going to be a new circular structure at the low point of the site with a small pump station off the side, and it'll pump to a clarifier. Those are two new structures um, that are to, tr to treat wa the waste stream from, from the existing processes. But uh, we were able to uh, modernize the, uh, archi the administrative areas, uh, new, new uh, break room, restrooms, control room, um, we're replacing all the SCADA within the same footprint. Uh, again, we're putting in plate settlers in the basins instead of making the basins bigger. Uh, we're taking a, a, a non-ideal uh, mixing chamber and putting in uh, redwood baffles, uh, walls to segment it inside its current structure and putting in mixers that are more appropriate sized for, for that space. But so. Yes, we're, we're adding two round structures in the back of the plant, but I believe everything else is original structures. So most of it is replacing equipment that's there or adding into some auxiliary equipment, like some blowers for the, for the, for the filters or plate settlers for the basins um, and doing so within the same structures. 
Uh, there also is a backwash tank. We are adding a backwash tank as part of the supply, which will come back up later in our discussion. But uh, um, there's a backwash tank to allow to better backwash the filters. Um, did that answer, is that appropriately answering your question? Yes, thank you. Yeah. All right, thank you. On the, on the chemical side, um, many, I guess most all the tanks out there, they're in the actual chemical building are, are around 35 years old. There was an alum upgrade that there, there's, the, those tanks are, I think in the 12 to 15 year old range. Uh, but most of the tanks are 35 year old. The, the equipment piping are in its useful life and, and um, that building is going to be modernized as well. Um, this is some of the mixers are out over the basins. Again, these are the ones that uh, um, we can't taper the speed and, and it's part of the uh, process improvements. Uh, these will be replaced with new mixers. Um, and, and the SCADA system, which I mentioned earlier, um, will also be upgraded as part of this project. Uh, and then the valves itself, um, uh, some of the valves that are open closed, you close them and it, it leaks past. It's hard to really troubleshoot, isolate, maintain. Most, most all the valves on the project are uh, on the site are being replaced in some fashion as part of the project. So it's, uh, you'll have uh, new, uh, new valves just about everywhere. Um, there were some that were very costly to replace. They were seldom or identified as not worth the cost to replace. So those were uh, deemed to relieve, uh, to remain in place, but uh, uh, for the most part, the valves are being replaced. Um, and then the concrete, go ahead. This is Harold, I got a question. Explain what the SCADA system is. You wanna talk about that bill? You want me to do it? Yeah, I can take it. it it's basically the, it's a computerized system that monitors um, all the valves, the chemical feed pumps, the, the all the mechanical portions and chemical portions of the plant. It's the operator's interface that they use to, to operate the plant from one central location. Okay. So let's go into cost and schedule. Uh, as Courtney said, as y'all know, uh, we, we uh, advertised and received bids in the spring of, uh, of 2020, and the bids came in uh, way over budget at $108 million. Um, we had only two bidders. Um, we did look at the what was happening in the marketplace. We had many, many discussions with both bidders about uh, how and why. And, you know, we were at the time looking at ways to reduce cost and, and, and rebidding and whether what the timing of that need to be. But what, as a general rule, what we got from, from, from that bid period was that the economy was booming, that uh, most all contractors, particularly our utility contractors, uh, were at near max capacity. They were fat and happy and um, were really not looking for new work. And when they were going after new work, they were not given it the same competitive um, um, situation they would have if they had to have the project and they were truly competing. Uh, we did only have two bidders, which, and they know there's only two bidders, so that even further uh, worsened our, our situation. At the time of our, our bid, uh, uh, tariffs had been recently been imposed, uh, U.S. tariffs on foreign goods, particularly on steel, copper, and aluminum. And the cost of, of those materials at that time were up 15 to 20%. Probably the biggest issue that we were all faced with during that period of time and the other utility uh, contractors uh, around the U.S. was a labor shortage. Um, everybody had jobs and uh, everybody was competing for labor and the cost to get labor uh, was going up astronomically. Um, and both uh, contractors that bid the project last time said that their labor costs were up 30% from the year before and taking on a new project uh, of this size was going to be further uh, they're already looking at 30% labor cost and they were saying, how am I gonna find labor to do this project? Um, so that, that was probably the single 
biggest issue that, that everybody was facing at that time. Um, and then um, it wasn't just at our utility contractors level that we had the challenges. Uh, it's, there, it's the subcontractors were seeing the same thing. While we had two utility contractors bid the job, we only had one electrical contractor and one HVC contractor, subcontractor, um, that actually submitted bids. And uh, uh, our um, general contractors um, kind of did their own cost uh, estimate uh, in, in parallel uh, with, with the bid before receiving bids for electrical. That's their way of kind of making understanding whether the bids are getting are, are in line with what they would expect. And, and they both said that uh, the electrical and the HVAC contract uh, uh, prices that came in were extra, extremely high for what they had anticipated coming in based on their analysis at that current market condition. So um, those all contributed to um, the bids coming in uh, at the $188 million. Um, so what's happened since then and, and what's different now? <clears throat> what should we anticipate now? Um, so you have six pre-qualified bidders that's, that uh, can and, and uh, we've been talking with to bid Nielsen coming up. The top two, Ullman Schutte and Adams Robinson were the two that bid the project previously. Uh, they're both uh, still very interested in the project. Uh, Keywit Crowder and Archer Western are also interested in the project. And uh, Balfour Beatty, the sixth one, is um, seems to be they're going through a restructuring. Their leadership's trying to figure out whether they want to stay in the utilities market or not. So um, right now, we believe, based on our communication, with the six that five of these six contractors are excited about the project and have expressed interest going forward. That's not to say we're gonna get six bids or five bids. That's just saying right now they're all interested and if it was today, they'd be bidding it. So um, uh, if one or two of them were to land, land a big job between now and bid day, they could change their mind. But right now we feel optimistic that we're gonna have more competition at the, our utility contractor level, which is great news. We have talked to um, all six contractors about the market. Um, should we anticipate bids go, uh, bid prices going up from last time, down from last time? What are they seeing and why? Um, and uh, what they're saying is, as a general rule, that things have stabilized. Unfortunately, they have not gone back to pre-2020 pricing but they have stabilized some, somewhere close to, to the 2020 uh, pricing that we all observed. Uh, we are seeing more competition around the state um, in, in bids coming out. Uh, steel and copper and aluminum uh, is more available uh, and the labor market is more stable. Uh, unfortunately, again, the, the salary rates have not gone down. They've stayed at the 2020 salary rates, but the risk of taking on a project needing the labor has gone away. Um, there is some shortages coming up, particularly with PVC, uh, stone and cement. I think that's a kind of a re reaction to all the works going on and those uh, commodities have been consumed, uh, but they didn't see that as a big issue. And they are seeing uh, on uh, recent projects that they are getting competition at their subcontractors level and they are seeing multiple electrical uh, subcontractors and multiple HVAC contractors bidding work in recent uh, months. So we're feeling, and what our contractors are telling us is that the, the sharp escalation that occurred between 19 and, uh, 2019 and 2020 has stabilized, but unfortunately has not gone back down. It's just stabilized at that uh, 2020 offering. We specifically asked Ullman Schutte and Adams Robinson if they were bidding it today, would we see a similar bid price? And they have said yes, plus or minus two or 3%, depending on just normal yearly escalations and uncertainty. So um, they're, they're anticipating, or at least the words we're getting from, from our contracting community is that the, uh, we should be anticipating something in that uh, 108, 110, uh, 
the price range. So we have been working, uh, staff and Black and Beach, you know, on what things can we do to the scope to reduce cost without impacting uh, long-term the plant uh, from, from the objectives originally set out in, in the project. Uh, one of the things that came out of our discussions with Ullman Schutte and, and Adams Robinson was um, cleaning out the raw water reservoirs uh, was something that they never really got their head around in the short period of time in the bid period. Uh, and they just put it in a budget number and that budget number was, I believe it was three or four times what Bill's been able to get the reservoirs cleaned from uh, in past years. So we have eliminated the reservoir cleaning and Bill is doing that uh, direct with his staff and, and subcontracting that uh, to be done outside the scope of this project. Um, we've looked at the scope, the, the actual um, product is being purchased and, and what's being done in the scope. And there's been uh, um, some reductions in some of the analytical equipment. Uh, some of the quantity of analyzers has gone down. Um, I mentioned earlier when we're talking about doing the chemical building upgrades, there were three tanks, the alum tanks that were um, um, about only about 15 years old compared to the rest of the tanks. Uh, those tanks are going to be remain, uh, going to remain in the project. And from an architectural perspective, uh, they took a harder look at, 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 at the finishes and the improvements and really the, the depth, the breadth of the improvements um, and have, desired, have, have made some reductions in some of the architectural, particularly in the flooring replacements um, and how far out into the plant it needs to go. Most of the work is being done more in the um, administrative areas and, and the other areas are going to be um, less improvements made. Um, and then we looked at what larger scopes of work is included now that if the bids were to come in high, um, higher than the, the budget going forward that could be deferred to a later date and removed from the scope of project. So we, we've got two bid alternatives included, or we, we'll have two bid alternatives included. One is for the backwash supply tank. Uh, it is something that could be added three to 10 years later, depending on when the need and budgets available. Um, and it could be done so without having to shut the plant down and, and adversely affecting the plant. And similarly, the improvements to the residuals lagoons, um, they could be made at a later date as well. So um, um, those two items, the supply tank and the residuals lagoon improvements um, are anticipated to be done as a, a bid alternative. Um, it, is, it is the full expectation of staff that the bids come in within budget and those two items go through as part of this project being constructed, but in the event that they uh, if the bids were to come in over budget, uh, there is opportunity within the bid itself to come to you with uh, an alternative to get within budget. So, this is the schedule. Uh, we're sitting here uh, in February, uh, assuming the uh, commission approves going forward with the current scope of project. We will be working with staff between now and, and April to finalize these changes and incorporate any other needs, get the front ends, uh, work with your um, MWBE program, make sure all that's taken care of in with anticipation of advertising in May, uh, opening in, in June, the bids, uh, in time to evaluate those fully and have uh, um, the bids coming to you for award at your July, um, commission meeting. So uh, that is the intent. Uh, it does have a 42 month uh, construction period um, after notice proceed. Uh, Jeff, you mentioned budget. What is budget? And is that that number up there in the dark blue? So, so let's, uh, let's go there. So I'm going to, at this point, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Courtney to talk to you about um, budget. <laughs> Jeff, I had one more question. Okay. Have we used any of those contractors uh, before that uh, are considering bidding? So we did a pre-qualification. Um, uh, I guess it was probably 2018. 
Um, and then we've reevaluated. Uh, Mike Stover and staff have asked that we reevaluate the contractor market to see if we should think about pre re redoing the pre-qualification. Uh, this, this group represents a really, really strong uh, construction offering for you. We were very impressed, very happy with the, uh, the response to the prequals. Um, this, this you do. This is a. Uh, this does represent the best in the industry right here. I'm a little disappointed that Balfour Beatty is considering getting out of the market, uh, but you've got uh, six really good co contractors. Crowder's done a lot of your work. Uh, Archer Western just did a uh, large expansion for for Black and Beach in in Wilmington area. Adams Robinson is. Uh, did some work for y'all in the past and has done some, uh, uh, is working for a project on us in, at another facility, doing a fantastic job. And Alderman Schutte's, uh, um has been trying to get in the, the market, in y'all's market for some time. They do a lot of work in Virginia and, and throughout the East. Um, great, great group of contractors. Uh, Jeff, this is Wesley. Mm -hmm. So what, what's the anticipated uh, value of the alternates, bid alternates? So your, your your mind's going to how much lower than the 110 is it going to be? <laughs> um, the, let's go. So I'll go down the list. The the contractors. This is beyond your question. I'm going to start this 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 list okay. here. The the contractors were saying that they were budgeting about a million dollars to clean the reservoirs. Um, Analyzers, it's hard to say what the cost of, of that reduction is because it's um, the analyzers are ten to fifteen thousand a piece, but it gets into control and wiring and and automation and everything else. So it, it's not a huge deduct, but it is. It's staff saying I do not want to waste uh, any money, so that's that was a reduction there. The atom tanks, the tanks themselves are not that expensive, but the reason we reduced them is because you had to uh, knock out a wall to get the tanks out, and then you had to do the coating replacements to put tanks back in, replumb them, and then you had to put the wall back up, and then you had to go to the other side and do the same thing again. So it was more about the destruction and the replacement of the tanks and the cost of the tanks themselves. So I, I would call that a half million dollars. I, there's probably about a half million dollars worth of architectural improvements, probably another half million dollars worth of field service supervision or whatever that was being reduced. So collectively up there, we're probably looking at three to five million total. Um, the backwash supply tank and the piping and valves associated with is probably another half million to a million dollars. Uh, and then the lagoons is uh, maybe, Two million. So there's there's five to seven total here. Um, so the the goal would be if it's a $10 million dollar project, if we can get down to feel comfortable, we hope it's going to come in at a hundred to hundred and three. Okay. Okay, and then it comes in at a hundred and eleven. Then maybe you don't do the lagoons or the backwash tank. But that that's 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 the mindset. But um, I will tell you that staff labored over the list, and there's a few more things that are in the 20s and $50,000 range that didn't make the, this presentation that they've also cut. But I um, um, just want to give you a sense of what they've done, yes. Good. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeff. Okay. Yeah. I, I just want to thank Jeff and Bill for what they've done. I, I think it was a great presentation. Thanks, Mr. Griffin. Um, yeah, it was good, and there was a lot of good questions. So um, I guess as far as next steps go, um, we will be requesting in our budget, our upcoming budget discussions, an increase of $40 million in the capital budget for Nielsen to cover the anticipated construction costs of around $110 million. Um, you know, I think you've, we've, updated you today on the, the critical need for the project and why we're recommending to move forward. Um, since the bids were received last April, um, we have worked with Lisa Saunders um, to include the additional costs in the spend plan. Um, and we will continue to manage our spending for this project as well as other projects uh, within the spending and uh, the funding for, for the utility. So um, 
we obviously have 60 million in approved uh, funding from the state with the low interest loans. Um, we are hopeful that we might get another uh, 20 million that's supposed to be announced later on this week. Um, so that's that's where we're at as far as recommendations on next steps. Um, is there any other discussion or anything the commission would like to discuss before we move on? This is Chris Parker. I've got a couple of questions. Um, one is, are we getting any regulatory pressure for this project? And then number two is, are there other projects of this size that are currently occurring in North Carolina? And if so, how do they stand on keeping within budget and schedule? So I'll let Bill answer the regulatory um, question first. Yeah, for, from the state's perspective, um, they every year they they have been noting the the basin shortfalls and in, in in regards to being undersized as far as a, a permitting um, perspective, but they have not pushed us um, beyond noting it on our annual inspection because. Um, you know, we've been in design and been kind of working through these issues with with the bid it, with the bids. So they, they do bring it up, but to date they haven't really pushed real hard because they they know we're working on it. And then Jeff, do you know of any um, other con um, contracts of this size and nature? And you know, if they're staying on schedule and within budget. So <laughs> this is a, an industry issue. Um, there's, there, there's, 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 there's lots of uh, projects that were coming out last year and, and late in, I guess it was really early 2020, uh, pre-COVID that saw the same challenge and it wasn't a Black and Veatch or a Winston-Salem issue, it was a across the board um, occurrence. Um, in fact, I, we just, uh, well, <laughs> uh, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to figure out how to give you instances without um, involving conferences, but um, um, it, 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 it Seeing 30 to 40 percent uh, over budget projects for about a six, eight month period uh, was a reoccurring phenomenon across the, the U.S. And it's not, it wasn't even a North, it wasn't just a North Carolina thing either. It was a, it was a U.S. thing. Um, I don't think I've answered your question though, have I? <laughs> <laughs> well, if that's your answer, I'm a little concerned. No, I'm, I'm saying what, what, what experienced, when, when we opened the bids in April of 2020, in the, in the uh, I would say surprise or let displeasure of seeing the bids come in so high, uh, that was experienced across the U.S. about that time for about a three to five month period there. Um, So in, so HRSD just put out a, a project that uh, had a budget of around $320 million. And I think it came in just under five here in the last uh, couple months. So, um, but it was the budget for that project was put together in late, uh, early 2000, uh, 2020. Um, I know in Brunswick County, they put a, a project on the street that was um, about $60 million over budget. It, it just, it happened everywhere. And I'm, I'm trying not to give too much details on which project and why, because it, uh, I just, it is, it's just, I don't know. I just don't want to make it public, I guess, from, from me, so. Jeff, I, I might have a question. Um, okay. What, what does our engineering people that's putting the project together, what, what are their feelings or estimate 
on the cost before it goes out to bids to the contractors? What is the feeling of the engineering, our engineering staff? So uh, again, what, what Black and Beach has done to help council staff in, in going forward and now to you was, was twofold. Uh, what I described here in, in the discussion was uh, our working with the contractors that were currently uh, familiar with the project that were pre qualified to get their direct input on what they're seeing since they're the ones gonna be bidding it. Um, and then internally, um, we have been communicating with, with our guys as to what we're seeing market-wise. We have not gone back in and done a line item by line item. Uh, we have not gone back in and done a line item by item check of the, of the cost. Uh, we've assessed it um, based on trends and we've, uh, we've done, a, I guess, our due diligence with the con construction community that would be bidding it. Um, and, and both are saying the same thing, that it is stabilized. So um, we're feeling uh, as comfortable as we can with the $100, uh, $110 million overall budget. Hey folks, um, it is, we are 30 minutes behind our schedule. So unless uh, uh, we have other uh, super important questions, I'd like to thank Jeff and Bill and, and ask Courtney to, to move on. But before doing so, uh, any final thoughts on this issue. Thank you for having us. Yes, thank you. Well, I agree with Mr. Griffin. Thanks. Thanks to both of you. Thank you. Courtney. Yes. Okay. So, um, Jeff, if you would stop sharing your screen, I will share mine. And we are running, as Mr. Tuttle mentioned, we are running a little bit behind. So we'll, um, let me share my screen. We'll go over our agenda next. And I will, and just to add, we'll, we'll have more to discuss and we can discuss this at the, the March meeting as well for the capital plan. So if you have any questions, you can let me know before then. We'll plan on addressing them at that meeting. Um, and, my, and Courtney, and you're, and you're talking about follow-up from this meeting too. I mean, so if people have ongoing questions or thoughts about uh, Nielsen, we can talk about it in March and in no way trying to Yes, yes, no, absolutely. That. Yeah, I mean, obviously for time, we just need to keep moving. But if you have right. any other thoughts or anything, let me know and we will you know, make sure we have some time in um, our capital plan uh, budget meeting. Okay, Mike uh, Covisto, if you want to run through the agenda quickly. <laughs> okay, thanks, Courtney. Um, good afternoon, commission members. Item two is the one operations item, consideration of resolution authorizing execution of various agreements regarding proposed water and or sanitary sewer improvements to be installed within various developments. This month we have five developer agreements with a total of $518,670 for water and $619,610 for sewer. Hey, I'm Mike. moving to the final. Oh, yes, Mike, yes, sir. I have, I have a question on... Do these do each one of these developers pay a systems development fee when they hook up? Uh, yes. So any new connection, any new um, building or um, house would would have to pay you the the system development fee. Okay, and it's based on uh, the size of the water hookup, or yes, yeah, so it's based on water meter size. That's correct. Water meter or water line water meter size. So a residential house um, with a five eight inch meter gets charged a certain amount for water and sewer, but it's based on that meter size. So it's, it's per the connection, not the line in front of your house. It's per connection. So it's per connection in the development, not the developer itself. Correct. Yes. So it's, it's, it's whenever any new building or structure connects to our system, then the, the fee is triggered and that's when they pay the, the fee. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Thanks, Courtney. Uh, I'll move into the finance items with item number three, which is consideration of a resolution authorizing acquisition of easements by deed or condemnation for the Avalee, Mark Mill, and Lowry Street lift station upgrades project. 
These lift stations were identified in the 2015 wastewater master plan as being near capacity with upgrades recommended for all three. To meet capacity demands, the Avali force main needs to be upsized from six inches to eight inches and will require easement acquisitions in the total amount of $9,100. Staff recommends approval. Item four is consideration of a resolution requesting MWBE goals to be set below the 10% minimum goal for the Avali, Martin Mill, and Lowry Street lift station upgrades project. The city's internal MWBE committee met to identify subcontracting opportunities for this project. After reviewing the scope, identifying the relative availability of MWBE firms and discussing the project specifications, it was determined that the subcontracting opportunities are nominal due to such a, a significant amount of the project consisting of materials. Therefore, it is a recommendation of the city's internal MWBE committee that the MWBE goal, uh, participation goals be set at 2% MBE and 1% MWBE for this project. Item five is consideration of a resolution awarding a contract for mowing services at utilities wastewater field operations facilities. This item is for mowing and landscaping services at Manson Meads, Elledge, Muddy Creek, Fry Bridge Road dechlorination facility and field operations. An RFP was issued with six proposals received, four of which had to be rejected for failing to include all the needed documents or failure to meet minimum requirements regarding pesticide licensing. The staff review panel recommended awarding a contract to Land Tech Grounds Management Services, Inc. in the estimated annual amount of $80,000. Contract can be extended for as many as two additional 12 month periods for a potential total estimated contract value of $240,000. Staff recommends approval. Mike, this is uh, Chris Parker. I had a couple questions. When Do Right yes, had the wrong person signing, I, I mean, what? I, I don't understand that. I mean, what, that just seems kind of Jerry, very. Well, Jerry, do you have a, a response to that, please? I, let me bear with me one second. I didn't understand the question quickly. Is it wrong person? Yeah, my understanding in reading the document was that a person who was not authorized to sign signed the uh, bid. And that was the reason why they were ruled out. I, I think the clarity of that is that no one actually signed the bid. It's required that a person who is legally authorized to bind the company uh, to uh, fulfill this contract, no one signed it the bidding document. So when you get something like that in, do you reach out to them to see maybe if they had an oversight? No, we do not. Legally, we're not allowed to give them the opportunity to sign that bid document after it's already been submitted. They're not allowed to alter it. Okay, so I see that Landtuck was the one who got the bid and it looks like from that documentation, they had the second lowest bid at 80,000. What was the previous year's cost on this? The, the $80,000, their bid was essentially, and it wasn't that much. That's our annual budget amount, the $80,000. In, 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 in a typical summer mowing season, we probably will not meet that $80,000 budget. The previous year's budget was less, uh, amount of money was less than that. However, we added some scope changes this year, uh, added a lot of pine straw in areas and things like that. that that enhanced the landscaping piece. So it was a difficult to compare apples to apples on this project. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, uh, moving on to item six, which is consideration of a resolution authorizing the transfer of funds to cover the cost of certain utility expenses related to road improvements along Meadowlark Drive. This item is to address water and sewer conflicts with the proposed work on Meadowlark Drive and includes the adjustment of water connections, water valves, hydrants, and utility manholes within the project limits. The construction costs for the water-related items are estimated to be $95,600, and the sewer-related items are estimated to be $1,800, and staff recommends approval. Uh, Mike, it's Chris Parker again. Could you maybe yes, explain, explain to us how how we decide whether these road costs are borne by utilities versus uh, the city or state. Courtney, do you want to um, follow up on that? Yes. Yeah, so Based on our conversation. 
sorry, with engineering. Yeah. Yeah, so basically it's the same way that we do it with North Carolina Department of Transportation. It's really who was there first. Um, so in situations where we had an easement first and then DOT comes in and puts in a road, they're responsible for the cost, similar to the city of Winston-Salem. So if we were encroaching, if we were in there right away and we were there second, then if they need to do any changes, then um, they were responsible for the for the cost to relocate those, those utilities. Okay, any other questions on item six? Okay, item seven is consideration of a resolution awarding a sole source purchase order to RP Adams for the automatic non-potable water strainer at Muddy Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant. Uh, the strainer system is a critical component of the wastewater treatment plant and the existing strainer at Muddy Creek is over 40 years old in need of replacement. Staff requested quotes from RP Adams, the equipment manufacturer, for an exact, an exact replacement to prevent building and piping modifications. RP Adams has provided a quote of $38,641.20 to provide the replacement strainer. Uh, staff is requesting to issue a purchase order for a non-potable water strainer directly to directly from RPI Adams as the sole source vendor in the amount of $38,641.20 and recommends approval. Item eight is consideration of a resolution awarding a sole source purchase order to Johnson Controls for fire alarm system improvements at Muddy Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant. Johnson Controls is the original installer and manufacturer's representative for the fire alarm system at the Muddy Creek Wastewater Treatment Plant Headworks. Currently, the fire alarm system is inoperable due to flooding at the facility. Staff requested quotes from Johnson Controls to reconfigure and install an updated system above flood water levels. And Johnson Controls has provided an estimate of $48,375 for the reconfiguration and installation of the fire alarm. Staff is requesting approval of a purchase order to Johnson Controls as a sole source vendor in the amount of $48,375 and recommends approval. Mike. There are no questions. Oh, yes, sir. Mike, it's Chris Park. I got a few questions. Um, one is, and I, I, I say this in seriousness, but I think I know the answer. Do we have flood insurance? Um, <laughs> number, number two, I, I'm having a hard time believing that we had been without fire alarm system at Muddy Creek since the flood. I mean, how long ago was that? And number two is these electrical components like this. I'm hoping that we are doing things at other facilities. So if we do have any type of flooding that they're better protected and we're not just doing it after, after the fact when we end up losing this. So three questions. So I, I have Mr. That. Parker. Yeah, thanks, Gordon. And um, Mike Stover can can fill in where I miss anything. But first, first question: Do we have flood insurance? Yes. Um, second part of this is this was part of the Muddy Creek plant project, so um, you know it was under the the insurance of the contractor. Um, and we can get into more discussions about this um, during closed session if we need to. Um, so. So as far as, um, I'm trying to think, Look, repeat your second question again, make sure I'm getting it right. Have we been without fire alarm system protection since that flood I was seeing was like in May? Yeah, so it's not that we've been without, it's just the whole system has been being built. So when it got flooded, we've been, what they're doing is Johnson Controls is redesigning where that equipment needs to be. Um, and. And so I, I guess, so I don't know, Mike, so if you want to add anything, I mean, yeah. I guess for a short period of time, we have been without it, but I'll let you fill in those blanks. Yeah, I'll jump in. The, the flood that damaged the fire alarm system was in August of 2020. Um, that was about the same time we took over and, and done the 30-day operational test. The, the reason a fire alarm system is, is necessary to begin with is because of the elevator, which still is not functional. So... You know, we've been operating the, the facility. Uh, believe it or not, there's there's no other building or uh, at Muddy Creek or I believe at Ellis, with the exception of Manson Needs, that has a fire alarm system such as this. Um, so what you know, what we're doing now with this Johnson Controls item, 
we're trying to get this infrastructure moved up higher so we don't have the same issue again. And the third question, Mr. Parker. Uh, well, I think Mike kind of answered it because I, I wanted to make sure that if we have electrical components like this and other of our plants that we be proactive about moving it before we actually have it flooded. Okay. Okay. Mike, you muted. But I believe this is my time to jump in. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, many of you are familiar with the collection system improvement program. As a refresher, we put together some slides to highlight the success of the program so far. Uh, we are in year five of the CSIP program. Item nine is um, a contract for the second half of year five. The first four years, we took a single item uh, early in the fiscal year that, that covered the entire fiscal year. This year, due to COVID and the uncertain financial picture, we broke it in two parts. This is the second part of year five, like I said. This slide right here uh, shows just the overall reduction of sanitary sewer overflows since the start of the program in 2015, 2016. We've had a 40% reduction in, in five years. Uh, in, in fact, recently, I think between December 17th and January 27th, almost you know six, six weeks, we didn't have a single SSO, which is the longest streak to date. This is a, a snapshot of, of how many miles of sewer mains we've cleaned to date. Uh, we've cleaned 1,749 miles of sanitary sewer mains. Of that, 46.1% uh, are unique miles, which means you know that they're not the same pipe. The other 54% could be repeat pipes where you've cleaned them multiple times over the last five years. The 46% represents about 830 miles out of our 1,800 mile system, which is quite impressive. This is uh, just a, a snapshot of our condition assessment program. We've done a full condition assessment of 21% of the system were about 384 miles. You'll see the heat map over to the left that highlights the worst performing sections of the system. That's kind of how we know where to, to go next. Uh, we've looked at 15 different areas so far in the last five years. Uh, of those, uh, of that 384 miles of sewer mains, uh, we've identified almost 1,200 red flag repairs. Red flags are, are repairs that are in immediate danger of, of a spill or a failure. You'll see the picture in the middle is a, is a, a sanitary sewer aerial. It's held up by a four by four post. And what you can't see is on the, where the pipe goes into that, to the ivy, that's a manhole that is suspended in midair. Um, we've done a small project and the picture to the top right is the final product. This is how the CSIP affects the capital program. Currently, we have almost $60 million in capital projects under design or evaluation or construction. The graph on the left, you can see the breakdown between sanitary sewer evaluation study works, about 10.6 million. We have, we have about $17 million uh, in preliminary engineering review, $17.5 million in work and design and almost $14 million in construction. And then to the right, it breaks it down a little further in the different uh, areas themselves. Lastly, uh, one thing that we added to the, the scope for year 5B is the emergency design of the Tanglewood Force Main replacement. Tanglewood uh, lift station is, uh, is in Clemens in the Tanglewood Park. It serves most of Clemens, currently Davie County, and, and takes flow from uh, the Fair Oak Station, basically all of the development around Laster Lake. It's a very large station. We don't have much redundancy. It's near the river. Uh, we have a lot of flow coming into it. You can see the, uh, the red circles are prior breaks. Over the past year, we've had two. Uh, one this past fall, I think actually in December, was fairly substantial. 
And uh, we've, we've done a pilot assessment of the force main and it, it is in dire need of replacement. What the plan is, is uh, to expedite the, the design um, and run a parallel force main and then keep the existing force main available to transfer flow in the, in the event we need to shut the new force main down. Any questions on the CSIP year 5B scope? Um, I, this is Chris Parker. I've, I've got a question. Does this, the scope of these projects year to year on the CSIP, is this a changing thing? I mean, is there any relevance to knowing how much we've spent in previous years or is, is, is that just going up and down? It, it varies. I have, I have those numbers. If you'd like, to, I can share them for you, Mr. Parker. It varies on several different aspects. Number of miles that we look at, you know, clean. Uh, so the condition assessment component, the number of initiatives that, that we have our consultant uh, do for us each year. Um, and, you know, if we have any of these special projects pop up. Another big component is staff augmentation. HDR is doing a bunch of work for us uh, with, with their in-house staff that our current um, staff cannot handle at the moment, uh, such as these KPIs that we're showing, some, some IT work, they're managing our cleaning and CCTV contracts, that type of thing. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, if you could send me that information, I'd appreciate it. I'll be glad to. Okay, any uh, additional questions about item number nine? All right, moving on to item number 10, which is consideration of a resolution approving a change order with CITI LLC for computer hardware, software, programmable logic controller, and supervisory control and data acquisition upgrades at water and wastewater facilities. CITI LLC was selected in the past as the utility's preferred vendor for this type of work through a request for qualifications process. And this item is for a change order to CITI LLC and then not to exceed amount of $519,986 for the replacement of the programmable logic controllers, security upgrades, and associated programming to address cybersecurity threats at the Thomas and Elledge plants, and to update the camera system at the Thomas plant. Staff recommends approval. Item number 11 is consideration of a resolution awarding a purchase order for the installation and maintenance of audiovisual equipment. We have the need to replace or install audiovisual equipment at five utilities facilities. Work will include installation of equipment and related work to ensure the standardization, compatibility, and ease of use of this equipment across the facilities. An RFP was issued and seven proposals were received December 4th, 2020. Staff assigned the top score to Clark Powell and Associates, Inc. of Winston-Salem. It is recommended that a purchase order be awarded to Clark Powell Associates in the amount of $255,090 uh, for the specified audiovisual installations and three years of technical support maintenance. The estimated cost of this work was $250,000. Uh, staff recommends approval. Oops, go ahead. Yes, sir. Mike, it's Chris Parker. I, I promise this is my last question since we are on item 11. Um, this audio visual equipment, it, it said including for utilities administration. So I assume that when we finally are able to get back together again, this will be in whatever new room that we're gonna meet. And it, I mean, is that, it, am I understanding that, that correctly? And if so, this question might be for Damon. Did the city share any of these uh, costs with us, especially moving costs, since they're going to be able to get our audiovisual equipment from our previous meeting room? Uh, the answer to that, that is no. That's a no. <laughs> and the second answer is. That's uh well, the 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 equipment that's in the current room will remain there and will be available to the commission anytime they need to use it. Ah, well done, Chris. I like the way you're yes, thinking. Sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, thank right, you, uh, Mike. Anything else uh, on items one? Uh, are you, okay, so uh, nope, thank you nope. for that review, Mr. Tuttle. And uh, yes. Would you like me to stop sharing the screen while you vote, or you want me to keep the agenda up? Uh, let me, uh, let's answer that in one second. Do any of the commission members want to discuss or pull items one through 11 
from a consent agenda vote. I'd like to move approval for items one through 11. I didn't get it. My, oh, my thing off Alan, I'm missing, up. sorry. <laughs> I was gonna say, I'd like to pull number, item number four. Okay. Uh, um, so I think the way to do this, Chris, if you could amend your uh, a motion to items one through three and five through 11. I would like to move approval for items one through three and five through 11. This is Wesley Curtis, I second that. Okay, then if, uh, Courtney, if you could stop sharing, please. We have a motion and a second. Any discussion on that motion? Uh, hearing none, a roll call vote, please. Uh, aye or nay, Mr. Curtis? Aye. Mr. Day? Yes. Mr. Griffin? Yes. Ms. Hines? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Jernigan? Aye. Mr. Long? Aye. Mr. Parker? <laughs> Did you? Okay. Uh, I'm Mr. Parker. He made the motion, so I'm going to presume for the moment, uh, Patrice, he's with us. Mr. Stewart? Yes. Uh, Mr. Wilson? Aye. And Mr. Younger? Aye. Mr. Parker, I'm you're back, back with us. I'm back. Aye. Mr. Parker? Aye. Is, uh, yes. Okay, that motion passes. Thank you. Uh, uh, Mr. Younger, uh, uh, do you have a motion or comments on agenda item number four? Yeah, my comments are that I'm going to continue to vote against any item that reduces the MBE or WBE goals, percentage of goals. Got it. So I, I doubt you want to be making a motion to pass it. So I understand that. And by the way, Courtney, uh, Courtney and I have been talking and there are, there is movement all by it slowly on equity kinds of and proactive works. And so, uh, but not ready for discussion quite yet. Um, any other commitment mission members care to make an agenda item motion on agenda item number four? This, this is Wesley Curtis, uh, I move to approve. A second, Dwayne. We have a motion and a second, any discussion? All right. Change a little bit, reverse alphabetical order. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Young, because <laughs> Mr. Younger, uh, you get to go first, nay. Did I hear nay? I don't want to put words in your mouth. Yes, you did. Okay, Mr. Wilson. Aye. Right. Stewart. Aye. Parker. Aye. Long. Aye. Jernigan. Aye. Hines. Aye. Griffin. Aye. Day. Aye. And Curtis. Aye. Thank you, motion passes. Thank you, Mr. Younger. Courtney, it's back to you. I am hoping, um, I mean, also Wesley, uh, heads up, uh, agenda item number 12 is coming your way. I'm ready. Uh, Courtney, any, um, what's next? So, um, we were gonna give a financial update, but if I know we're pushing up on two hours and being in a Zoom meeting, so I know that's tough. Um, if it's okay with the commission, we can wait and give our financial updates um, we can either send it through an email or wait to the next meeting and go ahead. Could and go you, ahead. could you or Mike, would you or Mike just please say, which I think you're going to say it's better than expected. Can you at least give us that kind of heads up? Yes, Mike, you want to just go over a brief. Super brief. Yeah, if you want to, yeah, I can record if you want to, do you want to share the, do you want to share the PowerPoint and I'll just, yeah, we'll go, we'll hit a couple of the, of the, High notes. Uh, um, Realizing that we have counsel just, on the line and are paying for this counsel, so just keeping in mind that. <laughs> right. Yeah. So here's our just our revenue update 
it's it's about three point seven million dollars higher through the first seven months of this year compared to last year. Uh, our cons our overall consumption is up about eight point three percent through that through the first seven months. And we've also we're also seeing a an increase in system development fee revenues of about one point seven million dollars. So on the build uh, revenue side, we're we're in good shape. Expenditures are um, still tracking slightly below last year and under the budget. So that's good news. Um, we currently have about 15,000 past due accounts and a total of 5.1 million in past due billings. At this time last year, we had about 2.6 million at the same time. Uh, and then we did reinstitute late fees in November and uh, terminations for non-payment in January. So we've added a couple of new uh, graphs here just to show you real quickly. This slide shows our past due balances since last April uh, with the blue bar representing our current past due balance total and the orange bar representing the past due balances at the same time the previous year. Um, and you can see we're, we're trending, uh, things are trending uh, in the right direction there. For us, um, we're, we're um, so I'm also trending in the right direction here. This shows the history of our delinquent accounts uh, where we're also seeing the decrease in January when we had 15,009 accounts and the average delinquent balance at that time was $337. So we started to, um, and we're also continuing to see customers sign up for payment plans. We've currently got about 1,700 of those active with a total of about a million dollars in balances tied to those um, payment plans. Mm -hmm. And then we've added a couple of other um, new slides here um, with the delinquent balances dropping in January, um, it's still ahead of last year. We did kind of want to sh start to put together some year-end projections to show you all. The blue shaded area represents our FY21 budget of $111 million in total revenues. As mentioned previously, we're about $3.7 million ahead of last year. If our revenues for the next five months mirror last year, we'll finish with about $118 million in uh, build revenue which would be about $7 million more than the budget. And then this next slide here um, shows our current past due balances in yellow and, the, and also shows us that we've got a little bit of a buffer if we don't make as much progress with our collections as we'd like to before June 30th. Um, and, and also I'd like to note that based on the first seven months, of our consumption and revenue, that, you know, this is kind of this 118 we're hoping is, is kind of a, a conservative estimate for where we may end up. So it is a it is the the picture is I would say much more positive, um, Mr. Tuttle, and um, we've also got some customer outreach opportunities that are coming up. The city and county are both receiving some funds that we're hoping will help our our customers um, moving forward, and there'll be more word coming out about that about that within a month or so. Thank you, Courtney. Are we ready to uh, go to agenda item number twelve? Yes. Yeah. And Mike Stover and Jan, our apologies for uh, cutting you short. I will take responsibility for bad time management, but it was all of the other questions. It was really not my fault. I'm just joking. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mr. Curtis. Uh, thank you, Mr. Tuttle, Chairman Tuttle. Um, I move that the winston salem First Life County Utility Commission go into closed session. This is February the 8th, 2021. Go into closed session pursuant to North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11A3 to consult with its attorneys concerning the handling of claims by MWH con contract con constructors incorporated and to preserve the attorney client privilege. Second. We have a motion and a second, and do, uh, I'm looking at internal counsel. Do we have to do a roll call vote? Uh, yes, please, Chairman. Oh, no. uh, okay. okay. <clears throat> Mr. Curtis. Yes. Day. Yes. Griffin. Yes. Hines. Yes. Jernigan. Yes. Long. Yes. Parker. Aye. Stewart. Yes. Wilson. Aye. Younger. Ye Aye. Okay, we are moving into closed session. Thank you to all who are saying goodbye. We appreciate everything you do for the Utility Commission.
all here? <laughs> yeah. Are we all present? <laughs> I know we, we have make the time quorum. travel. We have a Lisa <laughs> quorum. Okay, uh, now back to uh, order on the agenda. Mr. Curtis, I think we did. Did we have a second? I'm sorry, do we have a second? Somebody second. I'll second if we want one. Yeah, that's okay. It. Mr. Curtis. Yes. Mr. Day. Yes. Mr. Griffin. Yes. Ms. Hines. Yes. Ms. Dur Mr. Durrigan. Yes. Yeah. Mr. Long. Yes. Mr. Parker. Aye. Mr. Stewart. Yes. Mr. Yes. Wilson. Yes. And Mr. Younger. Yes. Thank you all. So sorry. We are almost an hour late. Uh, we'll talk. I'll talk to Courtney about maybe I can do a better job of seeing when uh, there's a big agenda item versus a uh, normal. Uh, 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 I'd like to get uh, the presentations forwarded. Uh, okay. The one with um, um, Jeff. Oh. All, of, all the presentations. Okay, we'll do. Thank you. All right, everyone. Anything else? If not, hasta luego. Have a great week. Bye. Bye. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank you.